talk's going to be about jitterbug, and I like to call it cross-language continuous integration for Git. Um, I am John Lito, and these are people, I think, doing the jitterbug dance, and that's why it's there, because jitterbug is fun. Okay. One thing is we should just define continuous integration in case people are not familiar. Uh, continuous integration, my definition, is continually and automatically testing code and usually with relevant notifications. So you want good notifications. Doing stuff continually and automatically is not very good if it's buried somewhere and you never check it or you don't know what's happening. And please feel free if there's a question, just shout it out or whatever. Uh, I'm not formal, you don't need to raise your hand or anything. Um, and then just quickly talk about why CI is useful. Um, knowing the exact commit that broke something is amazingly valuable. It saves you so much time. You don't want to be bisecting and searching through months of code to figure out what broke something. Um, and then automating is pretty important because there's an infinite number of different combinations of stuff. There's libraries, languages, OSs, browsers, everything. There's so many layers, there's so many versions. You can never hope to, ch to test them all, but you can hope to automate testing a bunch of them. So that's kind of the best we can do. But uh, it sure is better than just testing it on your own developer laptop or something like that. That's rarely what is production like or rarely what your customer is going to be running stuff at. So you want to you test things across various OSs and languages and versions of compilers and all that stuff. Um, the third point is quickly identifies tests that only pass on the author's uh, machine due to implicit assumptions. Com the most common implicit assumption is usually that something's installed. So, oh, I wrote my test. It needs Moose 2.0. I didn't specify that. Oh, now the test is going to fail. Now I go back and put, oh, I need Moose 2.0, or not Moose 1.0, or something, stuff like that. Or, you know, assuming some C library is there and not testing for it, stuff like that. So, CI quickly catches all these things. We're like, oh, I just assumed that that test would pass everywhere. No, I need to define the environment that it that, it tests, that that test passes in. Okay, so what problems does Jitterbug solve? Um, I think there's no point to writing any open source code unless it solves some problems for you. So um, people forgetting to run the test suite. If you run, if you have, hopefully you have a test suite, and lots of times companies I've gone to, sure, <laughs> yeah, we have tests, we do tests, and then you get there, and it's like, sure, we have this test suite. No one runs it. We never look at the output of it. You probably have to test or failing or something like that. So, forgetting to run the test suite is a there's no that problem doesn't exist anymore too. But you have something automatically doing it and telling people when stuff passes or fails. So, forgetting is is now solved. Another problem I notice is okay, sure we have automated test suite, but people don't notify each other when they see breakage. So um, if you have your developers maybe running the test suite before or after a push or something like that, someone might see, oh, this test is failing, like some other team's code or something like that, and it's 4.30 on a Friday, and you know what, I'm going to go drink beer, and I'm not going to you know, deal with this now, and then maybe you tell that team next week or, or something like that. You don't want to have to manually notify people when stuff's broken. So. Jitterbug just automates all this. We have RSS feeds, we've got emails, and we can hook it up to whatever, whatever other notification systems you want. Um, the third thing, um, which I think is really, really underappreciated, is having visual interfaces to things. Um, the command line is great. I love the command line. I live on the command line. But looking at a crap ton of data and making sense out of it is not the easiest thing on the command line. You can data mine and do all these things. but if you have a visual interface that you can look at data and make decisions like near real time, that's it's really valuable. So uh, Jitterbug gives you a web interface to see all your commits, see the output of all the, the tests, um, gives you the link to the commit diff, and all kinds of stuff like that. So it gives you all the data you need in a nice little web browser visual interface. Um, are there any questions up until this point? Everyone's awake, maybe? No? Yes? Okay. Maybe. Mark, are you ignoring me? <laughs> okay. Um, current Jitterbug features. I put number one as extremely memory efficient. 
Uh, how many people here use Jenkins or Hudson or anything like that to run tests? Okay, how many times does that run out of memory on you? Never? It's happened before? Often? What? It's Java. Okay, yeah, and so it's a Java. You expect it to run out of memory. Yeah, Java is a horribly designed virtual machine, but I won't get into that. Basically, suffice it to say that if you just want to run your Perl test suite under Jenkins, Jenkins is going to use like a gigabyte of memory to run your like test suite that might take like 200k of memory or something like that. So if you have like, for example, a Linode that has you know a small memory footprint, your Jenkins will, will run out of memory like like that very easily. So Jitterbug doesn't have that problem. It's Jitterbug is basically two Perl processes running, and there's no overhead. The only overhead is the overhead of two Perl interpreters, which is maybe five or ten megabytes each, depending on how you compile it. So I think that's one of the biggest features is memory efficiency. Um, second is probably integrate seamlessly with GitHub post receivables. So Jitterbug is not designed only for GitHub, but it's optimized for GitHub. So if you're using GitHub, stuff is easier. Um, basically, GitHub has this nice thing called the post receive hook. And you just click a button on GitHub and you say, after every commit, send this URL some metadata. And that metadata is in JSON. And then Jitterbug basically eats that metadata and then runs your test suite and, and does all the stuff that it wants to do. So basically, all you have to do is copy and paste the URL into GitHub's web interface and say, this is where my post receive hook is. And then Jitterbug is is eating that metadata that GitHub sends to it. Um, this is kind of the, the third point is the thing that, oh, you, I set the screensaver to be half an hour, but that didn't work. Okay, so the third point, uh, thanks. Okay. So the third point is the thing that I started working on in Jitterbug kind of got me interested was I didn't want Jitterbug to only be for Perl test suites, so of course Jitterbug is written in Perl, but it doesn't care what language your test suite's in. I, I use Jitterbug to run PHP test suites, I use it to run Parrot test suites, I use it to run Makefile based test suites, so Jitterbug doesn't care what your test suite looks like. It auto detects many common test suites from different languages, and then you can just tell it hey, this is exactly the shell script that you need to you know, build. If you have a very custom way of running stuff, then you can just say, here's my build script, do this. But um, if you don't, you know, if you have a standard thing like make test or you know, build test or something like that, Jitterbug detects all that stuff and says, oh, this is a build PL based project, I'm gonna run build test. Or this is a make file PL project, I'm gonna run make test. Stuff like that. So I think, Oh, good question. Dependency resolution? Dependency resolution? So you, add, you add three new modules. Dependency resolution works out. in Perl because I know Perl and the developers of Jitterbug all know Perl. So if you're using BuildPL or you know any of the standard Perl tool chain, then yes. So we use CPEN minus by default if you have it, I think, to install dependencies. And then module build if that's not there. And then so yes, for Perl dependencies, yes. Um, if you have C dependencies, or if you have, for instance, you know, Python dependencies and stuff like that, we have not gotten like every language's dependency chain down yet. So um, if you wanted Ruby or Python dependencies and stuff like that, that's not going to work. Perl dependencies will work right now. And the possibility is there for getting Ruby and Python and other dependencies to work. It's just... Uh, I am one of the, I guess I'm the largest user of, J of Jitterbug. I'm, I'm not the original developer. Frank Cuny of the Dancer Project is the original developer. But I kind of got on board and I think I have probably the most commits now because I went crazy and started adding all kinds of features and I use it for various things. So it's kind of, it's, it's the shiniest for Perl people, I would say, but definitely it's meant for all, for all languages. So does that answer your yeah. question? Okay, um, highly customizable YAML configuration file. So basically, just everything is a configure, you know, configuration directive in our YAML file, and you can turn on and off various knobs and tell it to, you know, also email you on a on a pass instead of only emailing you on a fail, and just little things like that. So you can you can customize, and I'll show you some of those customization customizations that you can do. By default, we just have email and RSS right now. Pretty much 
If you can send an email, you can make that go somewhere else. Like for instance, you can send an email to a pager and that'll get to a pager or or whatever. Um, for instance, we could add like a Twitter notifier or something like that and other things, but email and RSS has been has been pretty useful. That's what I do. I get emails on on failures and then occasionally I'll subscribe to an RSS feed of like a, a specific jitterbug project. Um, so like I said, it supports custom build and test scripts. So we have this auto detection fancy thing. So it goes through maybe 10 or 15 different kinds of test suites that it knows about. But if it doesn't find that, then you can say in the, in the YAML file, no, this is the way for this project, this is the way you build it. For this other project, this is the way you build it. So this is a, it's on a per project basis. And you can have in it as many projects as you want in a Jitterbug installation. It's only your memory is the only limitation. Um, and I think it has a pretty web interface, so I think that's pretty important, just like the, the visualization item was, so that's important to me, and I'll, I'll show you that soon. Like right now. Okay, so this is just like for first, uh, this is the dashboard, so when you go to the main page of a Jitterbug website, you're going to see a list of all the repositories that that Jitterbug knows about. Um, this is an old screenshot, and there's four repos here. And this is actually a really old screenshot. There's some newer stuff now, like we color stuff based on whether the last most recent commit passed or failed the test suite. So this is a, an old screenshot. But for instance, you'll see Jitterbug is very meta. Jitterbug runs its own test suite. So we've got that whole fun stuff going on. Um, I've been toying with getting it to run Parrot's test suite. That is, causes some interesting issues because Parrot has lots of C dependencies and other stuff. So you can uh, test C-based stuff. It's just that um, funkier stuff can happen. Like C-based programs are a lot more likely to like seg fault or do memory corruption, stuff like that. So you can, you can get more fun stuff. Um, then there's just a few other repos there. So that just shows you like the dashboard, which is kind of boring. It's just the front page. I'm, I'm actually trying to make it a little spiffier, but for right now that's what it looks like. Okay, now here is the project page. So for instance, we clicked on the Jitterbug link on the previous slide. Then you go to the, the project page, which is basically the build history. And then you get a date, you get the original commit message, and it will show the long message as well. If you have it, there was no long message here, just the short message. It gives you like the gravatar and the person you committed it, the timestamp, and then it gives you a link to the output of the test suite. So right here, there's only one test suite written, so there's only a link to one thing. You can have uh, many test suites kicked off. For instance, if you have an integration test suite and a unit test suite, you can kick off both of them on a, on a commit. As well, there's Perl Brew support. So for instance, if you had uh, Perl Brew set up with five custom Perls, um, Jitterbug would say, oh, there's Perl Brew environment variables. I should switch between all the Perls that are installed. So it'll run all your tests under every version of Perl and Perl Brew, and then give you links to each one of them here. So basically, you can kick off as many test suites as you want. Um, and get all the records there. Oh, I forgot. And then we have a commit diff link. So if you click that link right there, it'll bring you to GitHub commit diff. So that's really valuable. When you get a family test email, you go to the web interface, and even the email has a link to that commit diff. So then you can say, all right, who broke the test suite? Or what did I do? How did I break this? Um, it also tells you the branch is on reps heads master, and it took 14 seconds to run that. Okay. I'm going to continue if there's no other questions. Okay, here's another, here's an example of what an email looks like. So I used to work at this uh, research lab at Cornell that studied uh, evolutionary plants and things like that, but I got them to, to use Jitterbug and run their huge Perl test suite that had this massive, massive Perl test suite and no one really automated running it, so it often failed and things like that. So I hooked it up to Jitterbug and so here's a fail, this is an example of a failing email. The, the subject is, and this is customizable, so in the YAML file you can say what you want, like this prefix to look like and stuff like that. But it says Jitterbug, and it says fail in capitals because the test suite failed. This is the project name, so if, you know, this is like the GitHub project name, and then it says at, 
gives you the short SHA-1, so it gives you, I think, seven or eight digits of the SHA-1, which is usually enough. And then it gives you kind of the beginning of the commit message in the subject. All right, and then in the body of the email, we have got just the main URL back to the main web interface of this Jitterbug instance, in case you want to go there. Then it gives you the link to the project, so you can go directly to the project in Jitterbug. Um, in Jitterbug. And it gives you a link to the failing commit diff, which is usually the most important piece of information you want other than the output of the test suite. All right. Another cool thing is, by default, when you run, for instance, a tap-based test suite, you get this nice test summary report, but it's at the very end, after possibly hundreds of thousands of lines of output, and you don't want to scroll down to the end of the email to see that summary. So Jitterbug says, you probably want to see that summary at the top of this email. So it goes to the very bottom of the test suite, grabs the summary, and puts it at the top of the email so that you can see what is the summary of the test failure output. That's, that's important. Um, that's a small, small feature, but it drove me insane until I implemented it. So um, it's really valuable to have that test summary output at the very top. OK, uh, any questions on emails or anything like that? We're good? OK. What does your book look like? Haha, -ha. this is my, uh, this is a test suite output for one of the projects that uh, runs in the Jitterbug. There's this thing called Catch Music that, that I hack on. But basically, all the important test suite information is down here. Test database deployed. Fear of testing is the mind killer. All tests are OK. We ran 233 of them or something. And then result is pass. So um, Cthulhu is with us hoping our test suite. Um, list of some more current features. Um, oh, did I did I cut this? Oh, this slide is a slight modification of the previous slide. Okay, so already saw that it seamless with GitHub. Um, it'll run your test for Pro Five, Pro Six, Parrot, Ruby, Makefile. We support Python, uh, setup.py. We support a few other things. I can't even remember. We, we support about ten or fifteen different ways of running, uh, the common ways to run test suites. Already know about that, already know about that. Okay, I accidentally copied this slide and added a line to it later. Okay. <clears throat> One horrible, horrible thing that you should all throw tomatoes at me for is that Jitterbug isn't on CPAN because it's in perpetual alpha. It's just like, it's not shiny enough to send to CPAN or something. I don't know the reason. And I actually tried to push it up to CPAN this morning and Got down, went down a yak hole, and wanted to clean things up, and it's still, it's still not on CPAN. So, I hope to promise that it'll be there very soon. We, we need to clean up a little bit. The namespace of your bug is a little weird. Like all the code is is using the the main CPAN namespace Jitterbug, and with a lowercase J, which is only for pragmas. So it's just go in there and fix that, and just make it a little shiny. But uh, it will be on CPEN very soon, or else I'll be ashamed. Um, right now, you can get it on GitHub. And it's on Frank Cuny's GitHub, uh, one of the main Dancer developers. I didn't mention this, but the web interface for Jitterbug uses Dancer. So it's, uh, it's Dancer 1.3. Uh, it does not use Dancer 2. Um, Dancer 2 is incompatible with Dancer 1.3. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. OK, so we use BuildPL. I like CPEN minus, so you can install all the dependencies with CPEN minus if you want, um, or you can do the module build way, and then you can run our test with a little test. So pretty standard Perl. Um, should be familiar to people that have CPEN modules under their belt. Okay, so basically this is the quick way to get started. You edit your config.yaml, maybe you know, switch your, you know, customize your URL and the email address that things are going to, you know, maybe five or ten things in there. It would be nice if there's a web interface to change all the configuration data. So if you think Jitterbug is useful to you, you want to get involved, we, we could really use help in just adding nice features that are not complicated at all. It's not like some very complicated thing. You just need, like, for instance, a web interface to change some of these config variables. That would, that would be huge. Okay. Um, so Jitterbug is basically two processes. It's the web server, which is Dancer, and then you have this other uh, process, which is 
the builder, and that just you can run it in cron if you want, but usually I run it just as a never-ending uh, script that just waits for these uh, post receive hooks to come in, and then once it gets that metadata, kicks off the test suite, updates stuff, and, and then the website has that data. Okay, so this line right here is starting jitterbug on port 8080. You can give it a different port. I think the default port is 3000 because that's the default port for Dancer. Okay, next guy, this actually is deploying a jitterbug database. So you give it a config file that you want to use, and that's where you define the file name or the DSN for the database. Uh, by default, you use SQLite, so you don't need any fancy database setup or anything like that but you can use any database you want because it's all DBIX class and all that good stuff. You see we're giving the deploy flag here, so that's actually uh, creating the database and populating it and all that stuff. Okay, so this line right here is actually, uh, wow, I really like to do it right. This is the line where this Perl interpreter actually just lives on forever and never exits and just waits for those post receive hooks. Um, another thing is I would like these things to be, I haven't decided, some people have really said, you know what, Jitterbug should like be one command to start and then it should fork and do a web server and then have this other process. That is nice in one respect, but also loses a lot of flexibility. Right here, you can run this in cron, you could run it as a never-ending script, and then this web server can be like, it's totally separate, you know, you can, it's a different process. So I'm not sure how I, how I feel about that. Um, we haven't decided if, if everything should be kind of one script. Some people say that feels easier as you, you start one jitterbug thing, but right now it's two things. There's the web interface, and there's the builder. For instance, if you didn't want the web interface and you only wanted emails, then you would only need this. You don't, you don't need to run the website if you don't want it. So it's, I think, more flexible with, with the two scripts, but we'll see. Um, then the last step of the process is you go to your project on GitHub, you click on Admin, and then there'll be um, a thing where you, you add a post-receive URL. And basically all you do is paste in this URL, and for instance, if your jitterbug was example.com port 8080, the URL that you want to give GitHub is that URL slash hook, and that hook is a, is basically a, a dancer URL that accepts post requests and things, JSON gets posted to that URL, and that's the way jitterbug finds out all the metadata about your project, so that commit to the project. Okay. Interesting config file options and stuff. I also wrote this dude, which I needed because it was driving me insane. I'm reusing of Git repos. So I was running the Parrot test suite under Jitterbug. Parrot is 10 years old. The entire Parrot Git repo is like 200 megs or 100 megs at least. So by default, a lot of projects like Jenkins or Hudson, they'll reclone the GitHub, the Git repo that you're running your CI off of every time. So it was cloning 100 megabytes every time, every commit, to, to get the latest commit, which is horrible. Um, so I have this I, this option. I think it's, I have it defaulted to on because I think most people want it, is the first time it gets the hook, it downloads the whole repo because it doesn't have it yet. And then after that, it keeps a local cached copy of that Git repo and then does a file clone from that each time a commit comes in. It does not reuse the same exact directory because you run into horrible, horrible problems doing that. And I learned that lesson the hard way. So I think many people can benefit from this feature because it keeps a local cache of your Git repo, but clones, does a file clone from it. So it's always pristine on, on every commit. It's not getting dirty. Um, for instance, Parrot, had some weird stuff where it was seg faulting and going into an infinite loop and bad stuff was happening and it ruined my git repo and then every subsequent test run would, would be failing because of a previous run. You don't want that. You want a pristine repo every commit 
but you don't want to download that repo every time. So I think that's a really important feature, this reuse repo feature, and I think that is defaulted to on. Stack tasks is another interesting one. So for instance, if you really want to be atomic, you want to run your testing on every single commit. For instance, if you made five commits and then did a push, um, by default, Jitterbug would only test the most recent commit. So if you really wanted to be atomic and know, you know, let's say a feature broke and you want to know which one of those five commits made it break, then you would want the stack tasks on. Um, it is off by default because it does uh, make stuff take a lot longer. If your test suite takes an hour and you just push 10 commits, then you've got 10 hours of test suites running there. So, yep. Timeouts? Um, I believe we're using, like, what is it, the, I believe we're using the timeout, but I'm actually not sure. If not, it's a horrible bug and it should be fixed. <laughs> um, I've definitely written code to deal with that timeout, so I'm not sure if that code is in Jitterbug. I think it might not be. If, um, if it's not there, it will become like a default config file option of, you know, timeout of 30 minutes. Or One thing that's hard is by default, how do you come out with a default timeout number, you know, like people have very different ideas about what a timeout should be, so um, we'll have to figure that out. I think actually there's no timeout right now because I ran into an infinite loop in the power test suite and it totally aborted everything. So um, a timeout is needed. Thank you for reminding me. Us. Um, Perlbrew is pretty cool. If you need to make sure your code runs under like 50 versions of Perl, then Perlbrew to the rescue and Jitterbug understands Perlbrew, so that's pretty cool. You can do a lot of testing there. Now, beware, Perl Brew plus stack tasks is, is madness. You know, if you're running under 50 Perls and you're stacking tasks and each test we run is an hour, good luck. You know, you, you better have a farm of machines or something. So, yeah, you want to kind of hone things to what makes reasonable sense based on how long your test suite is. If you're lucky and your test suite is 30 seconds, Test every commit and do whatever you want. I like, I wrote this as well, and yeah, sure, it's nice to only get emails on a failure, but I actually like to see the emails on pass because, for instance, all my coworkers or, or uh, colleagues are working on in a different time zone or whatever, and I'm not seeing their commit on GitHub because I'm not awake, but I get the email that they committed something and everything passed. And I say, oh, cool. And, Go to archive it. I don't read the email. I just want to see that something happened and the test suite passed. Okay, now here's a here's an example of what the config file looks like. So we have this concept of plugins, then we have a DBIS class plugin, and then in there you say, all right, this is stuff relating to my schema. Um, I'm not even sure what skip automate does. That's a I don't think anyone is probably wanting to change that and don't worry about that right now. Here's an example of something I don't like, like instead of package it's PC, KG, and that's like our API for the config file format isn't really cooked, so I think a few of these things will, will probably change and that's another reason why it hasn't been pushed to CPAN. We don't want to push to CPAN with this like, oh okay, here is our config file format and then and then we change stuff next week. So really we should have a version configure uh, configuration file format, but right now we have what we have, and um, this package actually is just a DYX class package that defines a schema for, for our database, so it's pretty standard DYX class stuff. And then this guy right here is the, the DSN to connect to the database, basically <coughs> we want to use SQLite, and the DB name is jitterbug.db, so that will create a file in the, that directory and store the SQLite database in jitterbug.db. Um, this is pretty much probably going to stay the same for most people. You're not going to customize this stuff too much. Um, the per repo config is probably stuff that um, people want to change. So everything's in the jitterbug namespace. Okay, and then we have options. Okay, Perl brew defaults to on, email and pass defaults to off. Another cool feature I forgot to mention is Jitterbug understands branches. Um, there's supposed to be a hyphen there, but disregard that. Jitterbug understands branches. So you can say, all right, in the Parrot project, only run tests on master 
or branches that start with smoke me, or uh, I think maybe that was, this is an exact match, so it's either master or branches that, that are called smoke me, and that's supposed to be a hyphen there and something about this stuff. You can also use a regular expression here. So for instance, you wanted to say, I want to test all branches that start with QA blah blah blah. Then there you go. Just write QA dot star there or whatever. If you give it a regex, it will use the regex to try to match those branches. So right here we're just saying only these two branches with, with the or. Okay, and then we have uh, projects. So now here we're actually not only um, jitterbug configuration, but now these configuration directives under here are only for the project that they're listed under. So for instance, I was trying to run the Rakuto Pro 6 test suite under jitterbug, and we say, you know what, Rakuto has a you know, special way of doing stuff. We're just gonna tell you what the build script is. Like, don't try to automate like building it. We've got to get Parrot first and do all kinds of stuff. So we just say, you know what, this is our shell script to build it, and just use that, <coughs> execute that shell script. Um, and that's it. I'll just, I did some copy and pasting, and that was supposed to be an underscore there. It got, got killed. But basically, it shows you the flexibility of, I'm doing 10 projects in my Jira bug, but this one has a really special build process, so I need to customize that totally. You can do that. And basically, all these features are here because I needed them to do stuff and to test stuff. So it's been through the gauntlet of being used every day and, and being useful. So it, it has features that I needed. Um, future goals. Um, some of this has been done. I think this was a while ago. We didn't have Python support before, and now we have at least a few setup.py, and we, we understand that. We don't have any JavaScript stuff yet, so if you uh, if you do JavaScript testing and there's like a standard way of you know, seeing a file and saying, oh, that's probably this kind of test suite, then we could use your help and maybe auto-detect some, some JavaScript stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, PHP really doesn't have any standards with regard to test suites. There's just, it's, there's nothing. So, usually, um, I, I work on PHP some things. Unit. What's that? PHP unit. Oh yeah, that's a standard framework, but there's no standard for what the file is called in your project. So yeah, I, I use, I like simple test a little better than PHP unit, but what I do is like, if I have a PHP project, I'll just make a make file that has a test target and then that test target does the right thing, and then Jitterbug understands make files. So if it sees a make file, it says, oh, I'm going to try and make text and see if that works. So that's a pretty easy way to get around that. One huge thing that we need is not there is code coverage. We need develop cover integrated with this, and we don't have develop cover at all. And I think that's pretty reasonably simple. It's just no one's gotten around to it. <laughs> so if you're interested, in uh, adding code coverage to Jitterbug, we would love you, and that would be amazing. Um, and then also, some graphic visualizations. Just, you know, have a little graph of how many tests pass and fail, and, you know, just a little shininess to, to stuff. Have a few graphs, um, maybe uh, some statistics as well, like, yes? When are you done with the visualization? Oh, okay, no, I'm actually done. What about distributed testing? Distributed testing is a good question. So, for instance, there's like BuildBot and all these other things for distributed testing. Jitterbug is really like this lone wolf. Each Jitterbug instance knows about itself. It doesn't have any concept of there's like 10 slaves out there. But you have this custom builder uh, thing. So, for instance, you can just Jitterbug won't know anything about the 10 slaves that you have running tests, but you can just write your script to execute all your tests via SSH or something on these 10 other servers and then get back the, you know, copy the test file output back to, to this machine. So you can, like, do distributed testing, but Jitterbug itself doesn't know about distributed testing. It's is, the, is the build or architect in such a way that you can break that off and split out the run test versus collect result process? Um, I think so, yeah. We have like uh, Jitterbug inside is a collection of, of modules and there's like a builder module. There's a, and there's a few different modules. There's modules for the website. So it is, it is factored nicely into all the website Jitterbug stuff is totally different from the building of the test suite stuff. 
Um, I'm not sure if the builder and the collection of the output are split apart or if that's still in the same module, but it could be easily split out. I think maybe it's just a, a function uh, you know, on an object right now, which is like collect results. Another weird thing is, sure, we all know how to parse and collect tap results, but not everyone uses tap. So um, it's, for Perl stuff, fine. It, it all works, and Jitterbug knows how to parse tap and find your summary. But if you're using some other test framework output, like whatever, you know, Postgres has, you know, doesn't use tap and things like that, a lot of projects don't use tap, then it's hard to automate extracting information from the output of the test suite. So I think we would probably go down the line of having a plugin for parsing of the test suite, and then you would define this plugin that says, this is how I parse this, this output. I don't think we've gotten that far yet. So that, was, that would be a really cool feature to have like parsing plugins. Did that answer your question? Cool. Other questions? That one's good. Okay. So, okay, so future goals, I did that stuff, graphic visualization. Um, I guess, yeah, and the other one I, I forgot to put on here, I think I pushed the GitHub, but didn't update the PDF. Statistics. So, I really want to know statistics like how often does this test fail or how long does my test suite take now versus a month ago or anything like that. Those statistics are really nice to to know, they give you a lot of information and let you see trends in your test suite. So, um, oh, reserve battery, that's not cool. Good thing I'm almost on the last slide. <laughs> okay, so get involved, please. Um, install Jitterbug. Pound Dancer is, be is actually the best place on irc.pearl.org because it started in the Dancer project. We don't have our own IRC channel. There's too many IRC channels on, in the world, so. Come hang out in Pound Dancer or just find me on irc.pearl.org, um, Duke Lido. Um, it's on Frank Cuny's website, and I totally forgot. You can go to jitterbug.pl, the actual website. We bought the, the jitterbug.pl domain, so yes, you can go to jitterbug.pl. Totally forgot to add it to the, the slides. Um, thanks to Frank Cuny and the Dancer guys for starting. Jitterbug, it's really, it's, it's awesome. It's just helped me in all kinds of side projects and at work, and I found great use for it in, in many different places. Um, and then you can stalk me. No, no slides are complete with, without stalking slides. So I also have a PL domain name, so I went crazy with PL domain name. So duplia.pl, you can find the relevant infos about me there. You can go to LinkedIn if you want. I'm on Twitter, Antica. And you can find me as Duke Lido on Pearl.org and Freenode and probably a few other RC networks as well. And that's it.